we have Evelyn Sue of the Maynard Institute. Evelyn, I'd like to, you can take it away. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can, is this, can you hear me or? Great. Uh, I'm Evelyn Sue. I'm the co-executive director of the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. And it's great to uh, be in a room with students from all over the country and, and to learn from all of you. So thank you, West Virginia University. Thank you, Democracy Fund. Uh, the Maynard Institute is the nation's oldest organization devoted to diversity in the media. And those of you who were at the Kerner event that was earlier yesterday and you learned about the Kerner report and, um, and what Kerner had to say about media's culpability in all the urban unrest of the 60s, we came out of that as well. Because after the report came out, there was a, a small group of journalists of color. And at that time, there were very, very few journalists of color. And they came together um, and formed an organization to address some of the issues that were raised by the Kerner Commission. And this is a very old photo. None of these people knew that they would be posing for a historic photo at the time. Uh, among them are most of our founders. And in the middle, flanked by the, the two women, is the late Robert C. Maynard. And he is going to come up again uh, later. In the lower uh, right-hand corner is uh, Roy Ahrens. And Roy was a founding member and a long time, and a member of the board of the Maynard Institute until his, he passed away, and what he took, what he learned from working at the Maynard Institute, ah, the red button right there, whoops, am I pointing it even, I won't need it, I'm just the lower right hand corner, to found the National Gay and Lesbian Journalists Association. So they were just a very innovative, and visionary group of people. And I always like to um, show their photo because they started very small. They took one of the excuses that newspaper companies had at that time for not having a diverse staff. And the excuse was, we can't find anyone qualified. So what they did was they started training programs. And they created these very intensive boot camps and presented the newspaper industry, the news industry, with qualified people who then went into newsrooms around the country. In many cases, they were the very first person of color ever to walk into that newsroom as, uh, as a journalism professional. And I think um, it also shows that you can start small and build from a reporting program. They created editing programs, management programs, and one of the graduates of our Maynard Media Academy is in this audience, Meredith Clark. And you can have a tremendous effect over time. So last night, one of last night's questions was, why should newsrooms value diversity? And why are we making the case for diversity? And for a long time, the discussion was framed about diversity as, quote, the right thing to do. We posit that it is the smart thing to do. So. The next couple of slides are just kind of the world we live in today. Drastic drop in confidence in television news. 
drop in confidence in print media and newspapers, loss of confidence in major public institutions, including Congress and the schools. So one of the efforts to address this, and we are in this crisis where our credibility is being attacked, um, one of the, um, the efforts to address this is the Trust Project. And I, I encourage all of you to, uh, to check out the website. It's led by Sally Lehrman of the Marcula Center at Santa Clara University. Uh, she's gotten, I think, more than 60 news organizations to agree to a set of trust indicators. It's a way that news consumers can um, know that what they're looking at, what they're consuming, is verified and trustworthy. Now, she worked for several years with a lot of news media executives, and we're very proud that we were part of this effort. And they came up with eight core indicators. This is not a competition to see how fast you can read, because you can find this on the site. But it's a little bit of contest to see how quickly you can count, because if you count, you will see that there are only seven up there. And the eighth, diverse voices are an element or a key element of trust in the news. So what is fault lines? Fault lines is an analytical framework to help you approach your work as a journalist. And going to another question from last night, which is how can we support more open and productive conversations, Fault Lines is also a communication tool. It can get you to think about your own biases, and we all have biases and blind spots. And it can help you in your research and just explore at a much deeper level. So we all act on our perceived reality. Our reality is shaped by how we define ourselves. And Bob Maynard, who was in the middle of the picture, uh, a once-in-a-generation journalist, the first African-American to own and operate a major metropolitan newspaper, that was the Oakland Tribune, he was also, he thought very deeply about these things. And he said the most common ways that people define themselves are through race, gender, generation, geography. And seeing as how he was in the San Francisco Bay Area and earthquakes were very much on his mind, um, he called them fault lines. You know, it helps us think about our perceptions, why does something offend me? Why doesn't my colleague or the community see something the same way I do? Where's the disconnect? And it is a framework to have a respectful and honest conversations. So race. Class, and there's so many ways that class can be parsed. It's not simply a matter of income. Uh, I think many of us know people who necess don't necessarily have money, but they have social capital. They have connections. And those, and that can help them in their careers, can make problems go away. Uh, and those are all also elements of class. Gender. 
and our emphasis is be mindful and think beyond cisgender norms when you're thinking of this fault line. Generation. If you survey different generations, one of the most illuminating things, questions is what the major news events of their lives were. You know, for older generations, it's the Kennedy assassination. For some, it was uh, the attacks on the Twin Towers. For you, what, what are some of the, what would you define as a major news event in your life? Loud, louder, please. Katrina. Katrina, yes. The last presidential election. The challenger. And the Arab Spring. Mike Brown. The recession. The election. The previous presidential election. And one more back. Back there was, oh, okay. Geography. And you can take, parse this also in so many ways, not just urban, suburban. I, I was uh, speaking with, uh, was it Jasmine who was on the van with me yesterday and we were talking about your growing up as a, a military, in a military family. And so what is geography for you? It's very, it's very diffuse. And how you define home is, is very diffuse. So there's, you know, in addition to the, the sorts of neighborhoods that you lived in, it's things like, were you in a military family? Did you live in a, uh, uh, I lived in Florida for a while and there are huge communities of, um, of manufactured homes. So one question we all always get is, you know, what about politics? What about religion? And the main distinction that we draw is there are some things that you simply don't have control over. Your race, where you gr grew up, but your affiliations, your, your perceptions of culture, that can change, that can evolve. For the journalists, for your stories, you can ask yourself each time you're starting out, what does this story look, across, look like across race, class, gender, generation, geography? And I think most of you, you're, you're in graduate studies, you're very accomplished. You probably tend to think analytically anyway, but this gives you a ready-made framework to, um, to think and research and source and frame more efficiently and more fully. It can help you really be more nuanced in your interviews and how you tell your stories and make sure that you're telling things in context. Uh, all of us have read stories that are factually correct, but don't really tell the story. Okay, we're just going to look at a couple of news events very quickly, and you can tell me what fault line or lines you think are at play. Parkland. Class, Class yes. Race. Race. And generation.
this just happened? Gender and class, yeah. Even the headline writer realized that, using the word elite. This was a little while ago, but Serena Williams at the US Open. Immigration and status, geography. Marriage equality. Uh, I just, we just threw this in. If you're not familiar with um, the Kerwin Institute, they uh, they work on bias, and and they have some some great research and some great exercises, and. Uh, you, there's some things that you can uh, participate in. I just wanted to throw that in as a resource. But one of the strangest things I, we learned coming out of this is that hurricanes with female names cause more damage because there's a perception that they're less dangerous and people don't prepare. And uh, I, was, uh, I was just floored when I, uh, when I learned this. We have just a couple, if I could take like two more minutes. Has someone made an assumption about you based on their perception of how you align with one of the fault lines? And if you don't mind sharing. Or, or because I'm the only black woman in the room that I have all the answers on living in an inner city. Um, so those are just a couple of the ones that I've experienced. Thank you. Hamil. Um, that because I'm a big black guy, um, that maybe, you know, I may not be as sharp or what a focus in. And, and so therefore, he's just a jolly guy, but he's not that serious, so he can't cover politics and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I realize that I have to be a little more, I guess, calm with some people. When you start showing a little bit of confidence or power, they just assume that you're, I kind of want to use the word, but they just assume that you're kind of like a mean person, an angry person. So I realize that a lot of times I have to, I guess, tailor the way I interact with certain people so I don't come off as a ghetto black girl from Baltimore a lot. So, yeah. Thank you. I would really like to hear from some of the students. Well, I, ooh, this is loud. As a Latina who has an accent, who's first generation, I feel like I constantly have to check my accent and I have, because it does become a marker of how intelligent people perceive me and how they think I can process the world. Um, and and I, I feel like sometimes it is kind of color, co-changing uh, who I am speaking to so that I ha there's this constant need of having to reinforce how my American experience is just as valuable as others. This isn't, um, this is a little bit different than the other 
comments made, but I grew up in a poverty community in northern Minnesota, um, and people assume sometimes because of the way I dress or the way I look that I'm a lot wealthier than I am, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, like the, the more privileged kids at my college kind of try to talk to me about certain things and I have no idea what they're talking about because <laughs> I wasn't raised that way, so it's kind of interesting. Thank you. So that's me. Contact me. You can, we, if you need something, we're, we're happy to help. So thank you for your time. <laughs>